course, welcome you all to e-learning platform. Now we have reached week six. In this week, I will discuss about the summary from chapter one to chapter ten of Silas Marner, written by George Eliot. His real name is Mary Ann Evans. Me, Faisal Ahmed, with you throughout this lecture. Let's begin. Silas Marner, the, the Waver of Ravenel, by George Eliot. Characters in Silas Marner. Silas Marner, the Waver, miser protagonist. Godfrey Cass, son of the local squire. Dunstan Cass. Godfrey's greedy brother with a penchant for alcohol and manipulation. Molly Farrell, Godfrey's first wife who has a child by him. She dies leaving the child. Hippie child of Molly and Godfrey, who is cared for by Marla. Nancy Lamiter, Godfrey Cass's second wife. William Dane. William Dane <coughs> is Silas' former best friend, who betrayed with Silas later. Sarah, fiancée to Silas, while in Lentenberg, married William Dane. <coughs> After the false accusation of Silas's regarding theft. About Silas Marner. Silas Marner. The Waver of Ravello by Victorian novelist George Eliot was first published in 1861. The idea for the short novel, which she described as a story of old fashioned village life, came up when he suddenly and interrupted her plans for the writing of another novel, Romola. After the publisher John Blackwood read some of the manus manuscript and told her he found it somber, Eliot replied that it was not a sad story because it sets in a strong light the remedial influences of pure natural human relations. Silas Marner's story of loss alienation and redemption that combines elements of fairy tale and meet with realism and humor. Set in the fictional village of Ravello, it centers on Silas Marder, a waver who is forced to leave his hometown in the north after being falsely accused of theft by members of the chapel. <clears throat> His religious faith gone. For 15 years, Marner isolates himself from the life of the village and becomes a miser. But when the gold that he cherishes is stolen and he adopts a child whose mother has just died. His life changes dramatically for the better. Silas Marner has always been admired as one of Ilya's best and most appealing works. Not only is it a touching story 
the tears, like the fairy tale, happily ever after. It also presents a realistic portrait of 19th century life in a traditional English village in which the spirit of kindness and cooperation overrule petty differences. Summary of Silas Marlowe, Chapter 1. <clears throat> The Portrait of Silas Warner, taken from the adapted movie, is for illustrative purposes only. Once it was common in country areas to see men bent under heavy bags, waivers who had come from distant places. They are distrusted by the local people because they were not born and bred in a visible manner. One such waiver was Silas Warner, who lived near Ravello. His pale face and protruding eyes were fearful to small boys, and he was not much liked by their parents either, for there were rumors that Silas had strange powers, I mean ghostly powers. Jim Rodney had seen him standing once at Steve as a dead man, so dead man like ghost. But then he recovered and walked off. Moreover, Marner had cured Sally Oates when she was sick. And he might cure more folks in more folks if he could. All in all, it was best to be on his good side. Silas had come to Ravello 15 years earlier from a city to the north. There in Lantern Year he had been a faithful member of a narrow religious sect and his first feats of <coughs> unconsciousness were seen as a mark of special grace. Silas was the friend of William Dean, a friendship so close that they were called David and Jonathan. Even Silas' engagement to a young serving woman did not seem to chill that friendship. Only once William suggested that Silas feet was a visi visitation of Shatan, but Silas accepted the brotherly rebuke in pained silence. <clears throat> At this time, the senior deacon fell ill, and members of the and members of the congregation took turns tending him. During Silas' turn, the deacon died. Silas thought he appeared to have been dead for some time. Silas went to seek help, and then later returned to his work. That day it was reported to him that a bag of money had been taken from the bureau by the deacon's bedside. <clears throat> and Silas' knife had been found there. Furthermore, the empty bag was found in Silas' room. Silas remembered then that he had last used the knife to cut a stripe for William, but he said nothing. After further deliberation, the church members decided to draw lords to see whether Silas told the truth. The lords declared him guilty. <coughs> At this, Silas declared that there was no just God and accused William of the thief, theft. He expected that Sarah would desert him too. And he retreated to his loom for refuge. For refuge. The next day he received word that Sarah considered their engagement ended. A month later, she married William Dane. And Silas departed from Lantern Yard. <clears throat> so 
danger chapter one now chapter two silas life at regular is so unlike that at lantern yard that it seems almost a dream the countryside is different <coughs> the church has little in common with that of his old sect and even the old power he has trusted in seems far away here. War claims all of Silas' attention until he receives his first money. Then the coins, coins seem to offer companionship. Silas comes to look forward to the evenings. When he can take pleasure in the brightness of his gold. From his mother, Silas had learned the medic medicinal properties of arms, and once he uses his knowledge to bring relief to a sick woman. For some time after that, he is beset by villagers wanting charms against desire to other humans. Silas knows of no such charms, but his refusal is taken as mere ill temper, and after that he is more alone than ever. His work and his goal draw Silas ever further from contact with his neighbors. Only once does anything happen to show that he has any affection left. Silas drops his old pot and saves the peaches as a memorial of its long service. <clears throat> After that, there is only his money and his loom, and thoughts of them when he is away from home. He forgets his herbs, his life shrinks into the compass of his room. Chapter 3 Squarecus is acknowledged as the greatest man in Raven. The man of kind heart aristocrat, uh, belongs to aristocrat society. <coughs> the closest thing the village has to a lord. His sons, however, have turned out rather ill or bad. The squire's younger son, Dunstan Gus, more commonly called by the nickname Dunsey, is a sneering and unpleasant young man with a taste for gambling and drinking. The elder son, Godfrey, is handsome and good natured. <coughs> And everyone in town wants to see him married to the lovely Nancy Lemeter. Lately, however, Godfrey has been acting strange and looking unwell. One November afternoon, the two Cass brothers get into a heated argument over 100 pounds that Godfrey has left Dunsey. Godfrey has left Dunsey. Money that was the rent room of their father's tenants. The squire is growing impatient. Godfrey says and will soon find out that Godfrey has been lying to him about the rent if Dancy does not repay the money. Dancy, however, tells Godfrey to come up with the money himself. 
Les Dancy tell their father about Godfrey's secret marriage to the drunken opium addict to Molly Farrell. Dancy suggests that Godfrey borrow money or sell his prized horse. Wildfire at the next day's hunt, Godfrey box at this since there is a dance that evening at which he plans to see Nancy. When Dancy mockingly suggests And Dancy mockingly suggests that Godfrey simply kill Molly off. <clears throat> Godfrey angrily threatens to tell their father about the money and his marriage himself, thus getting Dancy thrown out of the house along with him. Godfrey, however, is unwilling to take this step, referring his uncertain but currently comfortable existence to the certain embarrassment that would result from revealing his secret marriage, thinking that he has perhaps pushed Godfrey too far. Dancy offers to sell Godfrey's horse for him. <coughs> God agrees to this and Dancy leaves. The narrator then gives us a glimpse of Godfrey's features. The empty, monotonous prosperity of the aging country square who spends his years drinking wallowing in, in regret. The narrator adds that Godfrey already has ex experienced this regret to some degree. We learned that Godfrey was talked into a secret marriage by none other than Dancy. We use the idea is a trap to gain leverage with which to blackmail Godfrey. Godfrey does genuinely love Nancy Levitt. <coughs> <clears throat> As the narrator suggests, Nancy represents everything missing from the household in which Godfrey grew up after his mother's death. The fact that Godfrey cannot act upon his emotions toward Nancy only increases his misery. <clears throat> Chapter 4 Dancy sets up the next morning to sell his brother's horse. Passing by Silas Miner's cottage, Dancy remembers the rumors about Silas's hoard of gold and wonders why he has never thought to persuade Godfrey to ask Silas for a loan. Despite the promise of this idea, Dancy decides to ride on anyway, since he wants his brother to be upset about having had to sell wildfire and he looks forward to the bargaining and swagger that will be involved in the sale of the horse. Dancy meets some acquaintances who are hunting. After some negoti negotiation, he arranges wildfire sale. Wildfire is the horse of Godfrey, <coughs> Dancy's brother, tender brother. Payment to be handed over upon safe delivery of the horse to the stable. Dancy decides not to deliver the horse right away and instead takes part in the hunt, enjoying the prospect of 
jumping fences to show off the horse. However, Dancy jumps one fence too many. And Wildfire gets impaled on a stake and dies. No one witnesses the accident and Dancy is unharmed. So he makes his way to the road <coughs> in order to walk home. All the while he thinks of Silas' smile. While Dancy passes Silas' cottage just after, just after dusk and sees a light on through the window, he decides to introduce himself. To his surprise, the door is unlocked and the cot is empty. Tempted by the blazing fire inside and the pitch of pork roasting over it, Dancy sits down at the he at the hearth and wonders where Silas is. His thoughts quickly shift to Silas smiling and looking around the cottage. <coughs> Dancy notices a spot in the floor carefully covered over with sand. He sweeps away the sand, pries up the loose bricks, <coughs> and finds the bags of gold. He steals the bags and flees into the darkness. <coughs> Chapter 5 As Danister leaves the cottage, Silas is no more than 100 years, 100 years away. He feels no alarm at having left his door unlocked because there has never been any need for a lock previously. He has been out after a pitch of twine he needs for his work the next day. And now he is looking for work to his supper. That supper is a pitch of meat tied to his handle. <clears throat> With a string and his donkey. With a string and his donkey which is the reason he failed to lock the doors. Silas comes in and warms himself by the fire. He sees nothing amiss because his eyes are weak. Not until he decides to count his gold before supper does he find anything wrong. The bricks are all in place, but the hole under, under them is empty. <clears throat> At first, Silas does not believe the gold is gone. <coughs> he searches all over the cottage, thinking he may have hidden it himself. Yet at last, he must face the truth. Then Silas cries out in anguish. Silas does not know when a thief might have come. There are no tracks. He fears that it may not have been a thief, but some unseen power that denies him tormenting him. <coughs> the thought of a human thief is almost a comfort to him then. And he recalls that the poacher Jim Rodney once lingered too long by the fire, finally stopped to light his pipe. <coughs> Silas comes at last to the idea that the robber must be caught. <coughs> he does not wish to punish anyone, but he wants his gold back.
He sets off for the village to proclaim his loss so that someone can recover the stolen money. Chapter 6 The conversation in the tavern is quiet. Animated by the time, Silas arrives. Though it has taken a while to get up to speed, the narrator describes this conversation in considerable detail. It begins with an endless argument about a cow, followed by a story from Mr. Massey, about a time when he heard the person bungle the words of a wedding bow. A story that everyone in the tavern has heard many times before. <coughs> Messi says that the person's lapse set him thinking about whether the wedding was therefore invalid and if not just what it was that gave weddings meaning in the first place just before silas appears the conversation lapses back into an argument <coughs> this time about the existence of a ghost who allegedly haunts a local stable The argumentative fire, Mr. Douglas, does not believe in the ghost and offers to stand out in front of the table all night, betting that he will not see the ghost. He gets no takers. As the rainbow's landlord, Mr. Snell argues that some people are just unable to see ghosts. Chapter 7 Sina suddenly appears in the middle of the tavern, his agitation giving him a strange, unearthly appearance for the moment everyone present. Regardless of his strange stance in the previous argument <coughs> about the supernatural, he believes he is looking at a ghost. Silas, short of breath after his hurried walk to the inn, finally declares that <coughs> he has been wrong. Landlord tells Jim Rodney who is sitting nearest Serenus to seize him as he is delirious. Hearing the name, Silas turns to Rodney and pleads with him to give his money back, telling him that he will give him a guinea and will not press charges. <coughs> Rodney reacts angrily, saying that he will not be accused. <coughs> the tavern goers make Silas take off his boat and sit down in a chair by the fire. Everyone comes down, and Silas tells the story of the robbery. That's all about this week. Thank you very much for being with me. The rest of the chapters will be discussed in the next week. Thank you and bye-bye.